Are you ready to conquer the chaos in your business? That's what we are going to cover on this edition of the Business of Story. I'm Park Howell, and I am absolutely delighted to have Clayt Mask with us today. He's the co-founder of Keep and author of his new book, Conquer the Chaos, The Six Keys to Success for Entrepreneurs. He will show you how to reclaim your sanity and your business by following a simple but powerful approach to your daily personal and professional activities. I learned at an early age that sometimes chaos comes from idle, restless hands. I was not much of a baseball player as a kid. Oh, sure, I could catch fly balls pretty well, but was kind of slow. I couldn't hit a curveball, fastball, or changeup, and I usually bunted off my middle finger, cultivating blueberries on my digits. Like most boys, I played on a lot of different teams. We even won the Maywood Hills Little League Championship one Fourth of July at Pop Keeney Field in Bothell, Washington, when I was in the sixth grade. The next year, I was moved from the minors to the majors on a team sponsored by Harms Paving. We weren't called the Indians or the Yankees or the Cardinals. We were just Harms Paving. I pictured our mascot as one of those cigarette-smoking guys splattered with tar, leaning on a shovel up to his ankles in asphalt, who stares you down as you ride by in slow motion in your mom's station wagon, with eyes that say, If you're not careful, Sonny, you're going to be working the ass end of a fire-breathing monster just like me one day. Even though I was on Harm's Paving Squad, I was never really on the field much. Mostly on the pine. No, that's actually too romantic. I rode the plywood, really. One game started like all of the rest. Nine of us took the field. There were 10 on the team. That left me and our head coach, Fred Vogt, in the dugout. Coach Vogt never said much. Screamed a lot. He was a hard-working paving contractor by day and did his civic best to coach us boys on those long Pacific Northwest summer afternoons and evenings. I was holding down the third base dugout. Well, dog run, really. No foxhole from which to emerge to do battle. No roof, just chain link fencing that impounded our bats, helmets, ball bags, and my dreams. Parents, girlfriends, and crushes sat right behind us in the bleachers. I felt like they gazed down on me with pity. I was the pathetic kid who couldn't break into the lineup for harm's paving. I was tired of riding the plywood and feeling humiliated like, you know, the pooch that just wasn't good enough. I knew there had to be a victory for me in this situation somewhere. Well, the fifth inning began like the 30 before it. Everyone took the field but me and Coach Vote. I was sitting next to him, palms flat on the bench under my thighs, with my legs casually swinging, cleats raking two shallow ditches in the dirt. Coach Vote grabbed his tar-splattered thermos and poured hot coffee into the silver lid cup. Behind me, siblings were whining to go home. Parents were buying them off with Cokes and licorice from the concession stand. Girlfriends were cooing. Even a dogfight broke out. When you ride the bench, you notice everything, especially the crush who isn't noticing you. I looked down, and Coach Vote's industrial keychain caught my fancy. He had a pound of keys hanging off his belt loop like bony minnows attached to a fishing string. Curiously, at the end of the conglomeration was a metal clip to attach even more shit to his waist. Separating me and coach on the bench was a dirty white bag filled with a couple dozen baseballs. 
Without really thinking, I reached down and clipped the ball bag to his keychain and then slyly slid way down to the other end of the dugout. You know, to get out of harm's paving way. Not 30 seconds later, there was a crack of the bat. Our rival sent a grounder screaming just in front of us down the third baseline. Coach voted instinctively leapt to his feet. Halfway up, he felt a tug on his left side. The ball bag found its purchase. His right hand, gripping his thermos coffee cup, kept going up and then over. He was doused with what I figured was a familiar sensation to him of black liquid splashing across his shoulder and down his chest. The attention in the bleachers went from the play on the field to the commotion in the dugout. Even our shortstop, my pal Paul Herrick, the best athlete among us who never knew the loneliness of the bench, watched the action unfold between me and Coach Vogt as our third baseman made the play to first. Coach Vogt stood there for a moment in frozen relief, and I guess disbelief, as he sized up the situation. He looked down at the ball bag leased to his side and then over to me sitting casually in the far, far corner of the dog run. Uh, I mean, dugout. He put it together in an instant. Flashing across his face was that same stare I got from so many pavers as if to say, boy, you're going to come to no good and wind up just like me if you ain't careful. The crowd gasped and laughed. Then a slow smile emerged on Coach Vogt's face. It wasn't what I had expected. Come to think of it, I have no idea what I expected would come of this caper. I just had to do something to kill the time in and the pain of the dugout. To my surprise, Coach gave me a look of, well, I suppose I deserve that. I earned a modicum of respect from him that day. No more playing time, but respect all the same, even though we never shared the same proximity in the dugout again. He made sure of that. I remember Paul running in after the inning and asking me what in the hell just happened. I told him what I was up to, and he gave me an attaboy slap on my back. Paul now coaches his own boys. He told me the other day that baseball, especially Little League, is not about winning the championship, but teaching your players how to win the day. His comment is what reminded me of this story. Even if you find yourself benched, use your curiosity, cleverness, and cunning to get yourself in the game. Create a little chaos if you have to. And you too will win the day in your own way. But sometimes chaos gets clipped on you. And if you're going to win the day over chaos, instead of causing it, you probably need a process. In the earlier days of our business, we didn't do this and our customers struggled more. And then we're like, oh, we need to actually take them through a process. And we created what we call the, the, the perfect customer life cycle. But it's basically a, the customer life cycle. What is the process your customer goes through? And we did that with the external marketing sales automation stuff. And then now we also do that with their internal workflows, their internal processes. So yes, the short answer is we see it all the time. And um, because we are in the business that we're in, in order for us to be successful, our customers need to be successful. And in order for them to be successful, they've got to get the processes, the SOPs, the checklists out of their head and onto paper. Clay Mask will share with you his six keys to conquering the chaos in your business and in your life. We start with the personal keys of mindset, vision, and rhythm, because you need to get this right to have long-term balanced growth in your business and personal life. The three business keys include strategy, automation, and leadership. The personal keys will help you prioritize and stay balanced while giving you a vision and rhythm to work toward your business and personal goals. Without adopting the personal keys, you may have strong business success for a season, even a long season, but it will be accompanied by personal sacrifice and disappointment as you struggle to get your priorities right in the face of the chaos. You'll learn how all of the keys work together in a virtuous cycle because as you build mastery of the personal keys, your capacity to implement the business keys will increase. 
Likewise, as you master the business keys, your ability to focus on the personal keys will increase as well. So grab a cup of coffee and settle in for this special chaos edition of the Business of Story with Clayt Mask. Clayt, welcome back to the Business of Story. Thank you, Park. So great to be with you again. Yeah, I think uh, you and I had a chance to chat about this time last year. Yeah. And uh, just covered the whole gamut of everything from your entrepreneurial journey, from launching Infusionsoft to then transforming it into where you are today with Keep. And now, not you know, for as an entrepreneur that sits around on his hands very much, you have not only <laughs> launched a brand new podcast, Conquering the Chaos, but you also have a book coming out. That's right. Conquer the Chaos. Well, congratulations. For those of our listeners who don't know who you are and or have not listened to that show last year, can you give us you know, your quick backstory? Yeah, you bet. So I, I'm an entrepreneur who loves helping small businesses grow. For over 20 years, we have helped small businesses grow with automation. With Infusionsoft, it was marketing automation. With Keep, it's business automation. So that's marketing automation, sales automation, service automation, operations automation, just creating the efficiency and the profitability in businesses that a lot of times falls by the wayside. You, you, you don't, you know, you grow revenue, but you don't necessarily scale profit and scale the business. So automation, we believe, is the great game changer for small businesses. And it's what our passion is. We, we do this for six, seven and eight figure businesses who are tired of the chaos and frustrated with the results that they're getting. And we help them to grow profitably with automation. My God, frustrating chaos. I mean, we are all <laughs> dealing with that, aren't we, Clayt? So you got into it first with sales automation and you built uh, Infusionsoft to a hundred million plus you know, company. Yep. And then what was it? Was, did you feel like that wasn't going deep enough? for the small businesses that you were working with that you needed to bring in more business yeah, automation? Yeah, well, what we saw was our, our best customers would take the automation beyond marketing and sales and they would use it for ser fulfillment of their services. They would use it for charging their credit cards and following up on invoices effectively and making sure they were collecting the cash and you know, everything from, you know, someone would get really creative and they'd use it for onboarding employees and they'd use it for offboarding or canceling customers and all of the processes and tasks that are associated with that. And what we started to see was there's a very natural evolution of automation that occurs in small business. It naturally starts with automating the process of generating a lead and turning it into a customer, but it falls short of what's actually needed to conquer the chaos. What happens is there's so much internal process, there's so much back office fulfillment, there's so much that goes into creating raving fan customers that you can't do it all in a small business. You just There's just not enough hours in the day. And so what ends up happening is they hire more people and they're, you know, they're adding payroll instead of, instead of adding profit to their business. They're putting more and more time in and, you know, it starts to feel kind of frustrating because the business is generating more revenue, but it's not producing the income impact and freedom that the business owner wanted. I kind of think about it like the Jetsons meets the Flintstones. So you give them this <laughs> great, you know, sales technology that brings in the leads and converts them to customers. But then the back end is the Flintstones, <laughs> especially, you know, I you love just, that. You're trying to figure it out, right? You and Barney are running around trying to trying to get this thing going. So well, you've I, taken that next step. Then. I love that analogy. It's fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, you and I and about 20% uh, of the audience understands. There's so many of the people don't understand <laughs> what we're talking about, but it's a perfect analogy. <laughs> Hanna-Barbera, baby. That's Go right. check it out. I love it. <laughs> so conquer the chaos. What got under your, you know, what B got in your bonnet to get you to start producing your own podcast. And by the way, thank you very much for having me as your inaugural guest on there. That was totally awesome. Love it. Yeah. But why the show and why the book? Yeah. You know, after more than two decades of working with small businesses, 
seeing what 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 successful you know what successful businesses do, seeing what successful entrepreneurs do, you start to see a lot of patterns. You start to see where predictably people slip up, make mistakes. And it's not always in the business. A lot of times it's on the personal side. And I have a lot of passion for helping entrepreneurs to create a great business and a great life and not have the business just dominate their life. And so after doing this for over two decades, I felt like, you know, we originally, my co-founder and I originally wrote Conquer the Chaos 14 years ago. Oh, and, really? And yeah, and we had learned a lot, but it was time to do a revised edition. I could, there was just so much we had learned in the intervening 14 years and the world has changed so much. You know, there's just so much different. And so I decided, you know what? It's time to revise the book. I went to my co- my co-founder and co-author and said, hey, Scott, I, you know, I think we ought to do this, especially because, you know, we're, we, we, we've moved to business automation. It's not just marketing automation. There's, there's so much more to share. And he said, listen, I think it's a great idea. Why don't you do that? <laughs> so of course. I, so I said, okay, I'm happy to do it. And the, the truth is I, I really, really enjoyed the opportunity to go back and take, you know, all those learnings that we've experienced as a company that we've seen. And, and what I thought was going to be about a 20% revision turned into about a 90% revision. It's almost a complete rewrite. And my publisher was fine with that, which I was grateful for, because as I got into it, you know, I, I, I wrote the book that I wish I'd had 20 years earlier. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I couldn't, as I got into the project, I couldn't do it justice by just, you know, trimming some things and adding a few things. I really needed to reimagine the whole book. And so the original edition was Conquer the Chaos, How to Grow a Successful Business Without Going Crazy. The revised edition is Conquer the Chaos, The Six Keys to Success for Entrepreneurs. And I, I, change things up a little bit, put a little more balance on the personal side. So the first three keys are the personal keys of mindset, life vision, and rhythm of execution. And then the business keys are very similar to what we did in the past, but with much more experience and hopefully wisdom that people can draw from. So the business keys are strategy, automation, and leadership. So this has been back of mind. I mean, you even wrote the first uh, book, what, 14 years ago. Was there something that happened recently or a trigger moment that uh, you came across that you said, you know what, I got to go back. I got to tackle this thing and get it out. Yeah, you know, believe it or not, it was turning 50. Oh, okay. I turned 50 last year and I said, you know, I feel like it would be a mistake if I didn't fully capture what I've learned is as an entrepreneur serving entrepreneurs and make sure I get that out. And so I, I don't know what happened, but there was kind of a shift where I went into a, the next phase of my career. And I just, I just wanted to create it to share it with entrepreneurs. So that was really the trigger for me was I turned 50 and, and I kind of started reflecting on things and I, I recognized how, how different things were now in our business with business automation, not just marketing automation. I recognized how different things were in the world where people wanted automation, they wanted AI, they wanted efficiency in a way that in the past when we would talk about it, it was a little bit maybe felt too impersonal and too mechanical or um, you know just sterile, not very, mm-hmm. you know, not, not very like, the heart and soul of small business seemed like it was hard to, to, for people to, to reach for that. But I've just seen how it's changed and how people are using automation in such beautiful, personal, amazing ways. And we feel so passionate about it. It just made sense that we said, okay, well, let's, let's get the book out there and teach. Let's get business automation out there and help people understand it. And, um, you know, I'm just going to kind of move into a different phase of my career where I, I get to just teach and share. Well, I know what that feeling is like. You turn 50 and it's a new chapter, you know, as they often say, you become more of an elder statesman in the business because we've all seen so much. And that was a full 13 years ago for me. Uh, 
And that's what really triggered me as well to write my brand bewitchery book because just of what you said, everything that we've learned yeah. that, you know, answering a lot of the same questions for the right. younger professionals coming up say, let's just memorialize this in a book as you have yep. and let's get it out there so you can be as a, a much service as possible to not only your customers, but your friends and family and colleagues and, and, and everybody else out there. That's right. Let's dive in to the six keys. And I don't know if we'll have time to hit every one of them. And in fact, we may not want to. <laughs> Let them get the book and That's read right. all about them. But, <laughs> but why don't you pick one of those first keys and tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the key of rhythm of execution because I think this is one that I didn't talk about at all in the book 14 years ago. In fact, I didn't talk about life vision or rhythm of execution. I did talk about mindset, but what I've learned is that entrepreneurs, we're, we're a bit episodic. We're a bit hot and cold, you know, fit, fits and starts. We, we tend to struggle with consistency and follow through. And what I've found is that while the high bursts of energy and the juggling all the balls and kind of keeping all the plates spinning while that works for a time it actually undermines the long-term success and the life balance that we're after now balance is you know i i define in the book i define success for entrepreneurs as balanced growth in your business and personal life that produces freedom and then i talk about what freedom is more money more time more control more impact um, and I take people through what that is. But to me, a balanced growth is like if, if, if entrepreneurs are defining success as business metrics, there is a great risk in their lives that's lurking. And it's, it's because the business demands and requires so much that whether you are quote unquote successful in the business or struggling in the business, either way, the business will consume everything that you've got. And sometimes it's very intoxicating and addictive and you just love it. It's so amazing. And other times it's like, man, there's worry and fear and just stress about, you know, whether it's, you know, meeting payroll or, or you know, dealing with a high profile client where there's a problem or you, you name it. But the, the, the pull and requirement of the business, whether the business is successful or struggling, is so great that if the entrepreneur does not have a very intentional way of of keeping their priorities straight and keeping balance in their lives they're headed for a a very a very tough brick wall and i've what one of the main reasons i wrote the book and p included these parts in is because in the 14 years since we wrote the last book i've seen friend after friend after friend after friend i've seen customer after customer it's just it's it's an epidemic and when you see what happens and you have the perspective and by the way and you flirted with it yourself because you're not uh, this this entrepreneur is not immune <laughs> we we all deal with it and i've got six kids i've got six grandkids i've i know what it is to to balance and try and you never do it perfectly but if you don't have an intentional uh, approach to this, whether you've got no kids or two kids or six kids or whatever it is, your health, your relationships, your friends, your family, it, it requires that we do something different than the, the, the normal way of trying to be an entrepreneur, which is mm -hmm. the business just takes everything. So I, I talk about the mindset as key number one. I talk about a life vision that your business can fit into. But the rhythm of execution is really how we avoid this problem. And by the way, in the book, I call it the dark side of entrepreneurship. It is, it's, the un, it's the ugly underbelly we don't like to talk about very much, but it's, it's filled with very dark and nasty things from you know, death, drugs, divorce to the more common things of great anxiety, you know, sometimes uh, addictions, sometimes seclusion and, you know, just social challenges. But it's it's real. And it, it's only compounded by the fact that many entrepreneurs deal with ADHD or OCD and, and, you know, in some dosage. So when you put all that together, we've got a concoction that's dangerous. And and I don't 
talk about this very often, but I do in the book make it clear that you've got to work on your mindset. You've got to have a life vision that the business fits into. Otherwise, the business will take over everything. And then you've got to have a rhythm of execution. And to me, the rhythm of execution is one of the great jewels in the book because I share what I learned and what I've learned and practiced from a whole bunch of different schools of thought, training programs, you know, literally millions of dollars of investment and that is a literal number from life coaches and executive coaches and all the things that I've done over the years and I and I put it a couple years ago I put it into a consumable package initially for my for a couple of my kids who were asking for it and then later for some customers and clients that were asking for it so it's in the book it's it's essentially a rhythm of how you manage all of the stuff that's required of you and how you do it in a way where you can have a, a well-rounded life that you have great fulfillment in. And to me, it's it's one of the great treasures in the book that I hope people uh, get a lot of value from. And that's what I want to drill down on just a little bit, Clay, when you talk about the rhythm of execution. If you could even define that for us a little bit more, because in my mind, what I'm hearing is, all right, I'm building my company. I'm having some fun, but having a lot of stress with it. I'm chasing some rabbits down some rabbit holes that I probably shouldn't be going down, or my operations aren't holding up. And instead of finding that flow in my business, I'm really fighting, finding fight. I'm yes. fighting all these different things. How do you define this rhythm of okay. execution? Okay, fantastic question. And in the business, I actually touch on it in the key to success number four, which is strategy. And we talk about exactly what you described. How do you create the flow? And, and in, in a nutshell, once you get really clear on your purpose, your values, your mission, the foundation of your business, and then then you create a um, your strategy, which is the the three year kind of the the three year goals and mission that you're up to, then then you create a meeting and operating rhythm. And in the book, I explain what that is, but it's essentially a series of meetings and planning sessions that tie the long term the the day to day execution with the long term vision. That's on the business side. On the personal side, the rhythm of execution is something very similar, but it's on the biz- it's on the personal side. And in a nutshell, it is dividing your area your your life into five areas where you do this in the life vision. And those five areas are physical, spiritual, social, business, and financial. And virtually anything you work on can be work can be fit into those things. Sometimes people say, well, where do I put hobbies? Well, you can put that into social. Sometimes you can put it into spiritual or, you know, physical. But but the point is you have these five areas and then there's how do you work on the goals in those five areas? And so you create goals around those five areas and you have a touch point in the a, a, a morning, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual approach to how you work on that. And I lay it all out in the book. But if I could just simplify it down, what I would say is if you look at this key to success of the rhythm of execution, and by the way, if you go study successful people all over, you'll find this over and over and over. They have a way of organizing those areas of their lives and then boiling it down to their important goals and accomplishments that they want to achieve. And then a systematic way that they work on it through a morning routine a weekly evaluation and planning and a quarterly plan that they are executing to that fits into the annual and the longer term picture. Now, the last thing I'll say is this. A lot of times when I talk about this rhythm of execution, the free spirited, you know, they start to shiver because they're like, oh, I don't want to be nailed down to this kind of stuff. I know my creative art just doesn't fit into that kind of thing. The beautiful thing about a rhythm of execution is that it's it's rhythm, it's art, it's not science, it's not math, it's very much the entrepreneur creates the rhythm that works for them. They get, they get that flow state that you just referred to on the business side in the personal side because they design a life that they love living. They design the activities that bring them great joy and fulfillment 
in the we in their week in their weeks and they they pattern it into their weeks and if they don't want to pattern it in then they create blocks where they can be spontaneous and if they need days or weeks they can do that but you don't have to do a structured regimented routine that causes you to feel nailed down you do need to practice some basic principles that will keep you focused so that you don't lose that focus but you 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 design it in a way that works for your life and works for your style. And that's what I cover in the rhythm of execution. So one of the real important then points on conquering the chaos is finding this rhythm. And as I hear you talking about it, Clay, I also think of it as balance. You've got to find yes. this rhythm in your life that leads to that balance. And you've got to be intentional about it. That's it's right. That's something that if you are too intuitive about it, and especially those young creative spirits, then you find yourself all over the place. And you That's end right. up burning a lot of energy and a lot of resources. And God knows I've been there when I ran my ad agency, Park & Co. And I was like, hey, we could do this. Hey, we could do that. Hey, let's try this. <laughs> and then at the end of you know the week, I'd go home and have that you know first beer. And I'd think, what did I accomplish? <laughs> right. And I would realize nothing. I've got all these great ideas. And every one of them, of course, of course was going to lead to a fortune. And of course, they never did um, because I was two all over the place. And then one day, where our building is over there on 44th and Indian School Road, right across the parking lot is Payway. So I go popping into Payway, have my lunch, and I've got this fortune from a fortune cookie that I've now held. I'm showing it to you I in love the video it. here, those listening. And here's what the fortune said. It was speaking directly to me when I was spinning my wheels back in the day. Do not mistake temptation for opportunity. Mm. And I think that's what you're talking about here, too. You've got to be intentional about finding that rhythm so that you can take the most uh, advantage of the, a few opportunities Yes, versus spinning your wheels on a whole host of temptations. That's exactly right. And it's true in your business strategy, and it's true in your personal strategy. That's exactly right. And it's about getting intentional and clear and when you do that in your personal life, it's amazing how it builds your business. And when you do it in your business life, it's amazing how it, it creates more space in your personal life. I want to explore that idea a little bit with you on blocking, because I think that's really effective. And it's not something that I've really perfected yet on my end, but I'm like that. I'm very, you know, creative spirit, I studied music, composition, and theory, and, and I try not to spin my wheels, but... I do have to have those unstructured times that I don't do anything of what I believe as import for the business. It's like, no, it's me you know, looking at these different rabbit holes, running around, trying different things, writing something up that just came out of nowhere. And Clay, what will happen to me sometimes when I do that is I will start feeling guilty. It's like, mm. oh, I shouldn't be pursuing this creative. As much fun and flow state as I can gain by doing it, it's not serving the business right now. But you also got to give yourself permission to do that, don't you? Absolutely. Entrepreneurs are creators. And it doesn't matter if you've considered yourself artistic, you are a creator as an entrepreneur. And your business and your soul require that creative space. And if you don't, if you don't build space to create into your days and weeks, you'll find a monotony and a, a routine that starts to calcify that is not conducive to growth. And so... <clears throat> Sometimes we do have to create blocks, create spaces that enable us to receive inspiration, ideas. Other times we need blocks and spaces that create the opportunity for us to try things and execute and make messes. You know, there's different ways that we create. Sometimes the create is in the creation is in stillness and is in reflection and and, and meditating. Sometimes the creation is in hyperactivity of trying a bunch of stuff and throwing a bunch of things against the wall. Sometimes the creation is in an innovative conversation with a couple of team members where we're spewing ideas and brainstorming and just vibing off of each other. It's almost like you're making music. Other times the, the, the creation is in a learning period where you're tuning everything out and you're able to just 
get deep into a topic that you've you've wanted to dig into and it, it sparks all kinds of things. You know, reading is actually a way to create. Most people don't realize that, but it actually it actually stimulates the mind in a way that's not even so much about what we're consuming in a book. It's 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 helping us to to cultivate the creativity in us. So, you know, I, I there are lots of ways to 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 build, block out and build in creation time. For me, one of the things that it took me a long time to realize this, but but playing golf actually does that for me. It creates it does something in my mind where it it causes me to begin to think in different ways. And for many years, I was so hustling and running and going crazy. I couldn't imagine taking a few hours out of a week to play golf. It just made no sense. And my coach would always try to tell me, hey, here's there'd be this benefit if you would do it. And I've learned that, you know, and this is, I think, just something that comes with time. You start to realize, oh, you know, this this is what wisdom is. You start to recognize ways that you can, <laughs> that you're, you actually learn how you operate really well. And, and everybody's a little different, but, but you've got to tune into that. You got to be intentional about it. And, and you can't feel guilty about putting creation time on the calendar when you're an entrepreneur, you've got to have it in there because it, it, it's how you get the best results in the business and it's how you create the best results mm -hmm. in your life. Clayton, how often do you play golf? Weekly now. Good for you. Yes. What's your handicap? 9.6. Dang, you're good. I'm at, a, I'm at a 13, so I'm going to come down and take on that 9.6 one of these days. Let's, What's it clears up it. down there? we got a blizzard going up here in northern Arizona <laughs> right now, so it's you guys are getting pounded right before the Phoenix Open, so yes. we'll have to figure that time. But I think you're right, and I would fall into that same trap, especially when I was running Park & Co., that I felt like if I was taking time away from the business and having fun, then I wasn't really in service to the people that worked for me and or my customers. And I cut golf out for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Of course, I had a lot of little kids too is it, at the point, and yep. I didn't want to take time away from them. Um, but when I got back into it, I had that same experience of just getting out and enjoying the fresh air and the camaraderie with people. And troubleshooting, yep. trying to figure out how you're going to get out of the mess you just got yourself in with that drive. <laughs> and I had never really equated the fact that that actually could play back to creativity within my business. I saw it more as a release, get away from the business, but I hadn't thought about it as a creative outlet. Yeah. Yep. I, I hear you. That's the way I looked at it for a long time too. And it is a release as, as well, but it, it frees up the mind in a different way for me. And it, it just just getting outside and, and having that experience is, is a good thing. And I in the in the in, in, the great thing is in Arizona in the summer times you can do it early in the morning, and so I can play early and and it's it's a it's a great thing to be able to you know do that while everybody's asleep, and then I go to work. And in the winter time though, I've got to build it into my schedule a little bit more intentionally. Yeah. So when you're blocking your time to find that rhythm and that balance between, you know, the hardcore business stuff and the, you know, creative stuff, what percentage would you say do you have on a weekly basis of what is focused on very intentional business practices and activities versus free form creative? Yeah, I get about four to six hours a week of time that is that is just free and thinking time, you know, just to be able to, now that's different than creating it in front of a whiteboard with a team. That's different than creating, you know, in a, in a session with a couple of my executives, you know, there, there's different kinds of creation, but, but that reflection, thinking, inviting inspiration during a work, you know, during the work hours, about four to six hours. Yeah. That's good. I mean, I, when I was running my agency back in the day, my mom and dad came down to visit and they were watching me run maniacally around and do this and this meeting here and then go get them and take them somewhere and then go do something. And my dad looked at me and he was a civil engineer and he goes, you seem like you're really busy, Park. And I go, I am, dad. It's awesome. <laughs> and he says, when do you have time to think? And I mean, that just stopped me in my tracks. I thought, what the hell is he talking about? I think nonstop. Right. <laughs> and no, what his point was, your point, is you got to get away from it and yeah. let things gestate and consider things. And yeah. And I, I do that block, you know, I do a couple blocks during the week in the work hours. But the real, the real secret to the rhythm of execution, the number one key to it is 
the morning the morning mastery. So I, I call it morning mastery. It's a it's a morning time that I have to exercise my mind, body, and spirit. And that has become sacred time for me. Between one and two hours a day is is generally what I do. But sometimes I do a, a 10 minute version. You know, sometimes it, you have to have a, a different version. So I, I wake up early. I do that routine. I cherish that time. Uh, that's where I do my best. I get my best ideas and inspiration during that. And um, that's where I, I, I love it. You know, I create, I've created kind of a, a, a sacred space down in my basement where I do that. And it is fantastic. I love it. And that's sort of meditative and centering for you before you take on the maniacal day that's always ahead. That's right. When you're an entrepreneur. That's right. Yeah. So people start getting dialed in this rhythm and this balance, this centering of their life vision and whatever. What's a next maybe surprising tip that you found that helps you conquer the chaos? Yeah. Well, let's shift to the business side. I think the thing that... The thing that a lot of times business owners don't realize is creating so much chaos in the business. Now, let's let's assume for a moment that on the personal side, they're starting to get things dialed in with their mindset, their life vision in their five areas that they work on, their rhythm of execution with their morning, weekly and quarterly routines. And there's the chaos of the business because it just is there. It's not it's not going away because you get all the personal stuff right. You know, the the. The chaos is as soon as you've got customers and you've got work to deliver on and leads to follow up on. And I think the surprising thing that I've discovered over the years is this. A lot of times people think the chaos is coming from growth pains or coming from the early stages of business where they're trying to figure everything out or they're, it's coming from an economic you know, a, a macro trend or a, a competitive environment thing. And all of those things certainly can have an effect. But the real cause, the when you get right down to the real, the real issue on the business chaos is that entrepreneurs don't stop to map their business processes. And that's where it lies. That That's where the, that's the foundation where you either, get things orderly or you live in a firefighting reactive mode that is chaos. And sometimes business owners will even, they will, sometimes they'll just come to accept it. That's just the way it is in small business. And some will even seek it out it's as crazy as that sounds. They, they almost don't know how to exist in their business without having some chaos. And so they, they actually will create the chaos. But when you take a step back and you recognize that, the, the business is a system and the system when it has leaks in it is inefficient and the, and the things that we say we want in business, which is more money, more time, more control, those things are leaking out of the holes in the system. And so when you take a step back and you look at a business that is an inefficient system, and by the way, only every business is an inefficient system. <laughs> there's, there's no perfectly efficient system out there. But we should be working to create a greater, you know, a, a more efficient business. It doesn't. It doesn't come with software. It doesn't come with automation. It doesn't come with dealing with the competitor or the economic force or the startup phase or the growth growing pains. It comes with what's the process in my business, and when the biz, when the entrepreneur slows down enough to go, oh. We've got a series of processes in our business that I'm not working on. And so the tail's wagging the dog and we're having to jump in every time the process doesn't work the right way. And why doesn't it work the right way? Well, we haven't mapped it. We haven't laid it out. We, have, we, we don't have our standard operating procedures that here's how we do things and here's exactly how it works. That's the cause of the chaos. And that's probably the most like as I talk to entrepreneurs and I kind of wake them up to that fact, it, it's an it's many times an epiphany for people to realize, oh, yeah. And then I say, and why is it not happening? Well, entrepreneurs don't really like to do that stuff. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's not real appealing to go and work on my processes, you know. 
a lot of times you'll have an employee or somebody who does want to do that and pushes for it. But most of the time, the business owner, that's not the way that they think. That's not the way they like to express their creation in the world. And so it puts them into this loop of chaos that causes them to not get the success in their business that they want. Well, I was going to ask you about that. How often do you come across entrepreneurs and they're asking for your advice? You're coaching them on getting these systems pulled together and whatever. And then you realize it's just not in them. It's just not the way their brain really works. And it's nothing against them. They are the high flying creative right. new entrepreneur that they need to bring in an integrator. Someone, and I've had people tell me that too. Park, you need an integrator to get your act together, mm -hmm. essentially, in yeah, some areas. Of course, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, do you see that a lot? And what do you think of that process? We see it constantly. It's almost more often than not. It's, it's, it's the exception to the rule of entrepreneurship that the entrepreneur is very process oriented, is very good at follow through, is very good at mapping out the flow chart. I mean, that's just maybe 10% of the time the business owner thinks in a process oriented way like that. That's just, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not mutually exclusive with entrepreneurship, but it's the circles don't overlap very much. Let's put it that way. And so mm -hmm. it is a very common thing that entrepreneurs will start to figure out, Oh, I need to get someone like that that helps me with it. A lot of times. And, and we, we encounter this very commonly because, because, a lot of times people think, oh, well, I'm going to get software to do this. And it's like, well, hold on. Before you put the software in place, you need to have the the process in place. And so it's it's part and parcel of what we do. It wasn't always, by the way. In, in the mm -hmm. earlier days of our business, we didn't do this and our customers struggled more. And then we're like, oh, we need to actually take them through a process. And we created what we call the, the, the perfect customer life cycle. But it's basically a the customer life cycle, what is the process your customer goes through? And we did that with the external marketing sales automation stuff. And then now we also do that with their internal workflows, their internal processes. So yes, the short answer is we see it all the time. And um, because we are in the business that we're in, in order for us to be successful, our customers need to be successful. And in order for them to be successful, they've got to get the processes the SOPs, the checklists out of their head and onto paper. Mm -hmm. I, you had mentioned this idea about, oh, I'll just get software to help fix that. And or now, oh, I'll just plug in AI to get that fixed. And I'm working with a tech company now out of Tampa that is specializing in AI integration into Salesforce and some other places. And one of the things I've learned in, in understanding what they do and how they do it is they said the amount of money, time, and employee resources absolutely blown and wasted on software and tech is unconscionable yep. because people think, oh, I'm just going to buy this software program. I'm going to plug it in and everything's good. That's and right. they're like, well, wait a minute. It doesn't integrate. We gotta, we've got to get an API in here to make this work. Right. And then you lose half your IT team trying to do that. And especially now with this race to AI, I would imagine that is a, an amazing problem. It is. It is massive. And, and whether you're, you're applying AI to help solve it or not, you've got to get the you've got to get your your process and your understanding of what you want to do. You have you have to you have an intention of what you're trying to do with your customers and with your work, you know, your process and workflows. So yeah, it's just it's a necessary part of automation, it's a necessary part of AI. You know, the AI can help you to to pull it out and but what I find is most of the time with small businesses if you don't have a guide to help you through that process, it's mm -hmm. it's pretty difficult. It's pretty tricky. So yeah. It's yeah, it's critical. And if you, you know, it's the age old Bill Gates quote, if you, you know, if, if you automate a bad process, you have a bad automation. You know? So you, you've got you got to start with getting <laughs> you the compound right. the problem, right. probably. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I was uh, going through this research and looking at all the pitfalls of AI automation and how do you actually get it to work for you? I came across and it just popped up in my mind and it was one evening and it's kind of a horrible insensitive metaphor, but it makes sense. So I'm just going to bounce it off of you sure. anyways, yeah. Clayton. If you run, if you say, okay, thanks, the show's over, that's <laughs> fine. But I equate it to Stephen Hawking. Here is this brilliant, brilliant astrophysicist mind 
locked in this body whose yeah. nervous system no long, longer works. Just imagine how much more impactful he may have been if he could have walked around a TED stage, mm -hmm. if he could have really animated what he, was going on between his ears, that, that brilliant mind of his, yep. and have the impact. And I think about people bringing AI in to find that rhythm and balance in their work, mm -hmm. that if they don't have the proper integration or really have a plan in place, they become kind of the Stephen Hawking of it. Mm. They've got access to this brilliant brain in a jar, but the rest of the operating system within the company just ain't happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. You know, I think every business in some ways is is that inefficient, untapped brain, brain that is not able to produce the beauty, the brilliance, you know, the the outcomes we're after. It's why there's such a disconnect between the freedom that business owners want and the and the chaos that they're experiencing. And that that's really where, you know, we we believe that automation and and AI, you know, we've we've done a ton to put AI into our product and it can change everything, but you've got to get the business process aspect of it. You got to see where the leaks are in the system, where are the things that you need to patch up in order to get the time, money, control that you're after. All right, Clay, give us one more tip in conquering conquering the chaos. Yeah, you know, I would say we've talked a little bit on the personal side, and we've talked about the 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 strategy on the business side, and a little bit about automation. So I would say, you know, in terms of leadership, when, when as, a, as an entrepreneur, it's very easy to hear and believe the things that your team or that others are telling you once you're, t once you're successful. And one of the things that I touch on pretty heavily in the book is the way that our ego deceives us as entrepreneurs. And as leaders, it's really important that we recognize that ego is the enemy. Ego is the thing that will prevent us from seeing what we need to see and doing what we need to do. And it's all over. It's in our business. It's in our personal relationships. And so I think the last thing I would say is when it comes to, there's, there's a lot that I cover in leadership, but in particular with entrepreneurs, the humility to receive feedback, act on that feedback and really look at it to see where the, where the the beauty is and the golden nugget is that maybe our our natural tendency is to turn away from. I think that is one of the great keys to success for entrepreneurs is that they embrace that uncomfortable feedback and they learn to check their ego to prevent it from blocking it, hiding, you know, hiding the self from seeing what it needs to see. So, you know, I, I just have I've seen that over and over and I've seen how the ego will take down an entrepreneur or create an amazing success story in an entrepreneur. And by the way, I've experienced it personally both ways myself. And so it's something that I believe that you've got to constantly be guarding against and, and being intentional about because that sneaky little ego will send you <laughs> down the wrong path. Well, Clay, you come across as a very nice guy and very generous with your time and totally in service to your colleagues and your customers. How do you check your ego? When do you know your ego is running away with you? And what do you do to overcome that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And, and I, appreciate the ob I appreciate the point you're making and I have a lot to work on, trust me. Here's just a, a simple thing. How am I, what's my initial reaction to feedback that I don't like. That's that's really when the look in the mirror moment. And it comes from a family member, it comes from a team member, it comes from a customer. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but my natural tendency is defensiveness. That's my natural tendency. Well, that's, that's survival instinct. Yeah. That's everybody's, yeah. right? And yeah. and so checking that and saying, okay, well, wait, what's what's true here? Mm -hmm. And and doing that regularly, like incorporating that into your daily routine. So I have, you know, in my rhythm of execution, I have a, you know, what I call daily doses. And there are certain things I do each day. And one of those is, is three pauses during the day. I just, I call them pauses. And those pauses are a time for me to stop and reflect. And by the way, they can, these can be three minutes. It doesn't have to be a long pause, but I find that at least three minutes. So it can be anywhere from three to 15 minutes, but generally I'll do it for, you know, three minutes. And I, I, I reflect on how I'm receiving feedback. I notice if I am breathing. 
and breathing intentionally. And I did. I used to not even think anything about this. And I'd realize as I was driving home, I, I you know I started thinking about breathing and got, got into breath work a little bit. But I noticed that when we get going, we don't take deep breaths. We don't take intentional breaths. And so I'll do. I'll in these pauses. I'll do an ego check. I'll do a breathing check. I'll do a, what I call a five, four, three, two, one, where I I basically am. I'm tapping into my senses and just kind of seeing if I'm present because a lot of times our, we're, we're going, 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 and we're not present and our senses are actually all kind of numbed. And then I have one, I have something I call the ABC method. And this is, these are all of different techniques I use in my, in my three pauses per day. And, and by the way, sometimes I don't get three pauses per day in, so I'm not perfect at this by any stretch, but Ego is one of the things that I check and ABC method is another one. And ABC method is when I notice a thought or something in me that's not producing the kind of positivity or the kind of way that I want to be. So it can be a fearful thing, a negative thing, a critical thing, an irritating thing, a nagging thing, you name it. Something that's not me, me being my best self. And I, and I try to identify what's the thought that's causing that. And then I say, okay, I see the thought. Ask myself if it's true. Be aware of how I am operating when I hold that it is true. And then that's the B. And then C is change the thought ever so slightly. In a perfect world, I change it 100 degrees and I feel wonderful afterwards. But that, that doesn't usually happen. And what I find is if I can just change, if I can modify the thought a little bit, loosen it up, not be so rigid about the way that I'm seeing that thought, it gets me out of that place of, of negativity and helps me to create a much better day. So those are some of the ways that I work on the ego, some of the ways that I work on, you know, my my daily doses to create a rhythm that I love being in every day. And I practice and work on it just like everybody, and I'm <laughs> far from perfect. Some of the best advice I've ever gotten and has been most productive and profitable coming from people always started in my mind once I hear their thought or their, you know, their idea, when I say, well, that's stupid <laughs> to myself, I don't say it to them. Right. And then I go, well, that was stupid of me to say that stupid. Why? So then I've got to do that same thing, step back and go, actually, that's not stupid. That's actually really smart. Where did that come from? And so I'll do it. I'll put it through the stupid test. That's me being stupid, saying, well, that's stupid. <laughs> and it, it's a great way to catch yourself. And then I do what I call the flip of a coin saying, okay, I think that's the bad side of the coin of what I just heard, or even what I'm telling myself if I'm stressing out, freaked out about something, you know, yeah. anxiety Love about that. something. Then I say, okay, so that's, I'm now looking at the dark side of that coin. What is the bright side? And I'll flip it over in my mind and go, oh, the exact opposite of losing $10,000 <laughs> is making $20,000. Okay. <laughs> Let's. How do we make that twenty thousand dollars and not worry about losing the ten thousand? And it's so it's sort of that kind of flip of a coin thing. I love it, and that that really helps me a lot because it's so simple, and I can catch myself when I'm being a Debbie Downer on something that I know. Okay, wait a minute. This is really dark right now. What's the bright side of this? Let's flip it over and say, is that you know, is that reasonable? Fantastic. Is that doable? What would I have to do? Or if it's not reasonable or doable, then I got to flip it back over and say, now I got to deal with this thing. This is truly a problem. And what are my next you know, ways forward? Yeah, that's fantastic. I love the flip the coin metaphor. It's great. The flip of the coin. The other thing I heard last year, actually, I don't know where it was my whole life, but someone said stress basically comes from just not understanding. Mm. So if we're stressing out about something, we haven't done our homework. Mm. We haven't really got our mind wrapped around what the situation is or how we could potentially do it. It's that lack of knowledge that really ramps up that stress. Mm -hmm. So instead of pushing away from a problem, embrace it, understand it as best as you possibly can, and then, you know, hopefully find the rhythm and the balance to choose yeah. the right way forward. Yeah, that's great. I yeah. love it. Well, this has been amazing. Clay, thanks so much for coming on the show to introduce your new show, Conquering the Chaos, and your fantastic new book. Where can people get your book and learn more about what you're up to? Yeah, you bet. I'll, I'll give you two resources. The first is they can go to conquerthechaosbook.com. 
to get the book and learn about some of the things that we're doing around the book launch. Some, you know, we've got a course, we've got a, a big event we're doing. So conquerthechaosbook.com. And then, you know, if, if there's anybody out there that's like, you know what, I... I, I could use a little help in mapping my process and finding where the leaks are in my system where time and money and, and, and control are, are, you know, inefficiently dripping out of my system. They can go to keep.com slash playbook. That's K-E-A-P dot com slash playbook. And what we do is we have a, a little process where we'll take you through what your business process is. We'll identify the three biggest areas of opportunity. And then we'll package that up for you and put it into what we call our growth and freedom playbook that's customized for your business. And you can take that and you can implement it yourself. You can go find a partner to help you do that, or you can work with us to help you do that in your business. But it's a great resource, a great asset that we do that involves a, a one hour session with one of our experts. And then we'll, we turn around and give you that growth and freedom playbook. So that's at keep.com slash playbook. And, you know, between the book and the, and the playbook opportunities, I, you know, I, there's lots of resources for entrepreneurs that we provide. And, you know, we want to help people go from that chaos to freedom and do it through automation. That's awesome. Last question. I'm going to put you on the hot seat, Clay. You ready? You got it. What's one big chaotic thing that you are dealing with right now in your own life, personal or professional, that you are going to conquer? Oh, I love it. That's a great question. I have four married kids and they all got married in a very short order. We had four, we had, we have six kids, four kids within five years. So we, we get to learn the phases of parenting in very <laughs> intense, rapid fire learning sessions. So we've got four kids that are married now and I have one in particular that we're working with on some things that's creating a little chaos for us as parents. And and by the way, our kids are all amazing. They're all incredible. And we we love them. We're so proud of them. And there's one in particular where there's a little a little relationship work to do based on, you know, some weaknesses we have as parents that we've, we've experienced over the years and recently. And so that's one that uh, my wife and I are working on right now. And we will conquer that. And I, we will create this before the end of this quarter. We will have a trip to go visit them that will be magical and amazing. How's that? I love it. Thanks, Clay, man. This has been absolutely awesome. And uh, congratulations on your new book. And, you know, I'm really hoping 2024, you guys just absolutely knock it out of the park there. I love it. Well, thanks so much, Park. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And uh, just always love talking entrepreneurship with you. I love your wisdom and experience. And thanks for spending a little time with me today. You'll never guess what happened many years after my harms paving baseball days. I had just graduated from Wazoo with two degrees. And one afternoon, I ran into Coach Fred Vogt in downtown Seattle. He was walking into a bank to cash some harms paving checks, I guess, and I was dressed in a suit and tie working for the Fury Group Public Relations Agency as a writer. He recognized me right away, looked me up and down, and in kind of a prideful way, he said, well, looks like you turned out all right, Howell. It just goes to show that a little chaos, when created for the right reasons, can stand the test of time in a good way. Remember, win the day in your own way. <laughs> if you enjoyed the show, please share it with someone. If you'd like to take the chaos out of your storytelling, then please shoot me a note to park at businessofstory.com. I'd like to thank Caden Howell for producing and editing our show, Darius Holbert for composing our music, and Marissa Hill for community development and marketing. Please join me next Monday when Master Coach Joelle Prochera will show you how to summon the magic in your work. Yep, she's a big believer in the magic the universe has in store for you, and she puts that same magic to work in her own business and will show you how you can too. Until then, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself, so make that one epic. Thanks so much for listening.